Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about improving uh, education and training. Um, it's Ken and myself. Daria, we, we were led to believe, would be here. She hasn't turned up, so if somebody bursts through the room looking harassed at the last minute, you know, it's Daria coming from IER as well. Um, it's, we're, as I say, we're talking about improving education and training, and it, and it was funny. Um, the back end of last summer, the DFE asked myself and one of Ken's colleagues to look at how we could improve employer demand for skills. And one of Ken's close colleagues, um, who will remain nameless, uh, and myself had a conversation about this, and he refused to do it. He refused to go along to the DFE to talk to them about it. And I said, why? And he said, because you and I have been talking about the same thing for 20 years. Um, it's about demand, not about supply. And that's one of the things that we really want to try and hammer home today. Um, at the moment, uh, we still seem to be stuck in a place where even if we're uh, recognizing the importance of demand, um, we're still not following through on delivering it. And we want to try and talk about that. And as part of that, we want to talk about skills as part of the industrial strategy. Um, and we want to consider uh, three things, really. One is workforce intelligence and forecasting. And I want to flag here a conflict of interest. Uh, the Welsh Career Service, uh, their in workforce intelligence and forecasting is provided by my institute. Um, I shall say a few words about that. Um, it's as good as it gets. I shall say, I shall say that at the moment. Um, a coherent system of workforce planning, I think, is needed, and within that, of course, the role of the education and training system uh, itself. One of the things that we uh, uh, looked at, and, and Ken was much more exacting about this than I was, was to go back and look at what Wales has been doing. And the Prosperity for All document, um, my heart sinks sometimes when I read these things, I have to say. Um, I remember being involved in uh, the Scottish economic uh, strategy 20 years ago where we wanted to be a smart, successful country, which sounds great, but I said, flip it round. What country in the world wants to become, become stupid? You know, everybody wants to be smart. And this thing about smart specialization, the key's in the word here, specialization. Not everybody can do it, but everybody's piling into this space, into this space at the moment. But actually, on this particular document, uh, Ken and myself thought there were some, actually some pretty good things in here. And I have to say, Wales, a bit like Scotland, is pushing ahead in a way that uh, England and Westminster are not doing uh, by picking up things about around equitable growth, for example, um, and trying to reduce inequalities in, 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 in attainment. And the point which has been picked up recently uh, by, by the Welsh Assembly around fair work. I mean, this is genuinely innovative stuff. I mean, in one sense, we could argue it's going back to the to the 1950s and 1960s when the UK really used to lead in these things through something called the Tavistock Institute where we were influencing governments, UK academics and practitioners were influencing uh, governments on an international scale and some of the work that was being done in Britain around fair work for Shell and some of the other, other companies were being held up as real uh, beacons of democratic possibilities. Wales is now picking up on that in the same way that Scotland is around this issue of fair work. And we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later. First thing we want to say, though, is about skills and industrial strategies. Um, it is very nice, and I appreciate what Mary was doing last year on uh, these, the skills strategies, but you know, everybody's now got a skills strategy. We've gone for, I don't know how many decades without anybody talking about strategy. In fact, the word strategy and industrial strategy was, we weren't allowed to say it in Westminster, but suddenly it's everywhere. And, uh, there are lots of localized versions of these things coming through, and we're working on one with the West Midlands Combined Authority at the moment. And essentially, there are, we think there are kind of three approaches to strategy. One is to repackage existing ideas. And those of you who saw the draft of the UK government's industrial strategy at the beginning of last year will have seen it was exactly that. It was simply a repackaging of existing ideas. There was nothing new in there at all. The second is around uh, devising what we call passive shopping lists. In other words, it's a kind of wish list, and then the people who implement or devise the, the industrial strategy step back and hope market forces will, will deliver on it. We saw that 10 years ago with things like the cultural quarters. Every town and city wanted a cultural quarter in Britain. Huddersfield, Hull, please, I, you know, if you want a tourist experience, go visit Hull's cultural quarter. 
It's two houses and a cobbled street. I think the same is now happening with this notion, and Marianne picked up on this, around the notion of place. There's nothing in the current industrial strategy, although it's heavily flagged around the issue of place, that would deliver an indust industrial growth in places, particularly those places which have not had industrial growth. And the third is to try and be more interventionist. But what that means and the extent to which governments will do that <coughs> is a moot point. So, for example, in the current version of the UK industrial strategy, intervention is very much based on supply again. If you look at the industrial strategy around VET, for example, it's about improving the numbers of apprentices. Three million. Where that figure came from, God only knows. It's a bit like 50% for higher education. It was about improving the number of apprentices. It was about improving the quality of their education. Great. It was about setting up institutes of, of, of technology. There was nothing in there about whether employers needed 300, uh, 3 million new apprentices. And in fact, when we had a consultation with Bayes around this, we said to them, there is no further demand for apprentices. And they said, where have those figures come from? And we said, you. A report published by Bayes two years ago, produced by us, showed that there was no increase between 2004 and 2014 in terms of STEM apprentices. If you want a genuine industrial strategy, you're going to need to stimulate demand. How they might do that, as I said, is a moot point. And in this case, Ken in the paper's got this very nice quote around, does it pass the jelly test? Um, and maybe Ken, do you want to say something about the jelly test? I like it, but you, you can... can... read the quote? This actually is a wonderful quote, which was a tre treasury official uh, made this uh, many years ago, and it's cited by the since. And it goes back to the days of the Department of Trade and Industry of beloved memory. We often subject what the DTI submits to us by way of those key technology proposals to a red jelly test. If we can substitute red jelly for, say, optoelectronics without any damage to their case, then we don't think DTI has presented a very good case because it doesn't discriminate one technology and another. It's a good exercise to go through because you come up with statements like, we should support red jelly because red jelly produces a risk of this. Or there are fantastic externalities for red jelly. Bullshit. We want to know precisely what it is you are claiming for this technology as opposed to any other technology. That could be the treasury to death. So, you know, you substitute the word jelly for whatever's coming through in, in an industrial strategy. Does it make a difference? And although there's a lot in, in industrial strategies, both local and national, about skills and training, Actually, as we, it really is, if you look through this, try and find anything which is about demand in there. It's all about supply. And what we think is you know, workforce planning has to be embedded into industrial strategy. And workforce planning that responds both to current needs, and we talk a lot about what employers want, so we should respond to those employer needs, although a bit later we'll be careful about what those employer needs are, but also the desired needs of whatever government, local or national, is pushing forward its industrial strategy. What, as we've been talking about before, there is a difference between what's good for countries and good for regions and what's necessarily good for individuals or even, or even employers. And in this sense, there's a kind of two-part Welsh strategy. There's, one, there's two parts of Welsh, Welsh strategy. One is, what can it achieve as part of the UK's government's industrial strategy? And what can it achieve that's specific to the needs of Wales? And so we come to a number of kind of challenges and opportunities with this. Um, and both Ken and myself have been long enough around, um, around Whitehall and Westminster to know that we can never talk about problems. We always have to talk about challenges and opportunities. Uh, in fact, in, currently with Brexit discussions, we're never allowed to talk about the problems. We can only talk about the opportunities around Brexit. And one of them is clearly around careers, careers guidance. It is absolutely true that generally, certainly outside Scotland, um, for the last 20 years or so, careers advice has been absolutely abysmal in the UK. It's fragmented. Players are piling into it. We don't have good systems either in some schools or in some good colleges or even for all age and, and, and for adults. We are improving in some respects with that. And I, and I think, actually think the, the Welsh Careers Strategy website is a pretty good example of that. 
But generally, it's about, if you look at where most kids, forget the middle class kids, because they know what their roots are in life, they're going to university. And they're told that very clearly by their parents and by, and by the schools. If you look at where most other kids get their advice about careers, it's from their parents. And in many cases, the parents are living and working in jobs from the past, if they've got jobs. So when kids go into FE colleges, for example, the number one careers advice that they're given comes from the parents. When they're leaving, the number one career source for them is still their parents. There's a huge gap there that a career service needs, needs to fill. In order for the career service to be able to provide that, what they need is good workforce intelligence and forecasting. And governments either directly produce it, as in the UK, or they at least sponsor it through other organisations. And what's really needed is good, reliable workforce data. Um, I have to kind of partly say this, because as I say, because it's a vested interest, we, we provide it. It's called Working Futures for the UK. Uh, it's based on the Labour Force Survey. And, and I would partly say this as the director of the Institute. If you gave us more money, we could do a better job. But it's also the case that the Labour Force Survey, upon which it's based, also needs more resources. Because the weaker that gets, the weaker our projections get. And both Ken and, my, and myself have got real, real qualms about how far we project ahead. I mean, as, as you know, in, in this room, once you get beyond two or three years with, with projections, they, they become pretty difficult. And so IER produces these, and one of them we produce was, and what would we, in 2010, we produced what would be happening in 2020, and then bang, um, sorry, 2014, sorry, 20, in 20, 2006, we produced what would be happening in 2016, and in the middle of that period, the, you know, the GFC happened. So we have to kind of continue to revise it. What we do know is that the US produces the gold standard for this, and that's because it's long established, and they throw lots and lots of money at it. <coughs> And unlike the UK system, they have people who go into workplaces and watch what people do and take notes and revise their occupational classification on the basis of it. The Americans, and we had some over at the Institute the, the other week to advise us on how we can improve uh, working futures, um, themselves will whinge about how poorly financed they are, uh, but it's all relative. You know, for us, they are the gold standard. All we have in the UK, and, and which feeds through into Wales, is pretty good by European standards, and the European Union uh, commends it for that. But, but there, are other, there are other versions of this, um, which can be provided by uh, other organisations. ROA in, in the Netherlands, for example, has a system of different, uh, different organisations. Sorry, <clears throat> ROA in the Netherlands and the Czech Republic, they have different models. And the Czech Republic, they've got three institutes working on this collaboratively in a row. They're developing different types of single institution, but developing different types of modeling around that as well. So what we've got in the UK at the moment is as good as it gets for the money, um, but there are still lessons for, from other small countries that Wales could pick up on. And one of the things, and I may be shooting myself in the foot here, is whether Wales wants to develop or at least boost its own system of labor force surveys and skills in order that we can get better uh, labor market inf information and then intelligence ar around that. It is also true that the ONS is effectively going to roll back on the labor force survey in the future and over the next two, sorry, th next three or four years until about 2020, 2021, when they'll be introducing something that they're calling the labor market system They'll do away with the labor force survey, and they hope to be able to plug into administrative data as a way to improve the scope and coverage of our labor market intelligence. But it is even essential, when we were talking about having short-term horizons, to be able to make it more accurate, it's still very clear that what we need to do is to build in some long-term trends. And as much as Ian was scaring the bejesus out of me, um, there is a need to kind of build in and factor in some of those things around technology. And it may be that, um, as somebody was mentioning before, that these things won't come to pass because governments will intervene and, 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 and try and control them or regulate them in ways which will take the edges off um, some of the technological interventions. And certainly there's a kind of social democratic middle ground emerging around that, that we need to ameliorate some of the potential downsides of, of technology. The other um, area that we need to think about is coordinated workforce planning. And in this sense, there are two elements. One is labor market projections. 
which is, as it says, for the labour market, and we've just talked about that. But the other is, is understanding what we call, might call workforce adaptive capacity. In other words, how workforces inside firms change dependent upon the introduction of new technologies and new, and new ways to work. And what we can see from recent research is that there's a good link between the extent of this capacity and productivity in workplaces. And we used to think that it was just high-skilled workers, graduates, you know, the solution to everything was graduates, that, were, that had the best adaptive capacity. It turns out that even FE slash VET intermediate level skills also capable of, of demonstrating high adaptive capacity. So we need to think across both intermediate level skills and high level skills in this. But what we need to do in order to think about what we need for the future is to get employers to think about their workforce requirements. And that is incredibly difficult to do. Most organizations don't do it. They might have something where they'll think about succession planning for individual jobs, but thinking ahead is pretty difficult for them. How, what, their, what will their workforce look like in two, three, four years' time? Difficult. And that's particularly acute for something that we've not mentioned today, which is for small and medium-sized enterprises. Most of those people in those organizations don't have good HR functions. So it's difficult to get them to do it. And it's a major weakness in, in the UK. And, but those industries which are capable of doing it, like the UK energy industry, can build in and factor in demographic changes and think about who they're going to start training in the future, whether they should be looking at younger workers or older workers. And in this respect, there are hints internationally that there, there can be a, a more coordinated approach to workforce planning that is not only required, but it can deliver if it involves other stakeholders. Uh, and one of the key areas around this that we've been talking about is, is skills ecosystems. Uh, but these skills ecosystems have to cover both supply and demand. Um, and when we're talking about supply, it's not just about more skills, but also about the pipeline through which those skills are delivered. And by that, I often, if, if you look at what employers do, employers will employ graduates over somebody who's got, for example, A-levels for the same job on the, on, the, on the belief that graduates have more and better skills and therefore be more productive. But actually, a lot of employers don't know what graduate skills are. And frankly, neither do most universities. You know, we measure employability at the moment by whether you've got a job and if you've got a good salary. If you go into universities and say, what are graduate skills? A bit like digital skills. Everybody talks about them, but very few people know what they are. And if we don't know what they are, it's pretty difficult for employers to know what they are as well. So some of the pipelines that deliver those skills, we need to think about. Some of the recruitment, uh, the recruitment selection decisions of employers. So it's not just about skill development and training, it's about how those skills are delivered into workplaces. And demand too, we think, needs to be disaggregated between the skills to get the job and the skills to do the job. And I know economists have, sometimes have difficulty with this. We have our battles with, with DFE and DFE finally getting their heads around this. That The reason we've got over-skilled workforce or an over-educated workforce is because it now takes a graduate to get the job, but not a graduate to do the job. And that's simply because there's more skills and more qualifications in the labor market. So we need to really think about, not just when we're looking at and trying to analyze the labor market, the skills people are required to, to, to get the job, but what is it they're doing when, once they're in, in their jobs? And that's where, as I say, the Americans are pretty good because they get people to go in and watch people still at work. Now, unfortunately, this, to, to move into this system takes policymakers out of their comfort zone in the sense that it makes things very, very messy. And it makes things more complex. It's not a one-stop, we'll boost FE through introducing more apprentices. It's not a one-stop, we will expand the higher education system and produce more graduates. It requires people to come down, these other stakeholders, not just the providers and employers, but actually some labor market analysis and policymakers themselves to sit down and talk about what's required to both meet um, the workforce needs or employer needs and the needs of whatever organization is particularly pushing its, its sorry, is pushing its particular industrial strategy. Um, and in this sense, it's a more holistic approach to education training, but it's also one that might deliver fair work. And if you look, for example, at Australia, which, is, which has tried to pilot some of these things, 
particularly in, in, in some of the agricultural industries, what they've got is all the stakeholders involved and try to have kind of micro system, these kind of small ecosystem, industrial system, modeling of what skills are needed, what labor markets are out there, and so who needs training and what they would be trained for and trying to improve their employability. So we we're talking before about, about, um, uh, about the tourism industry. It is true that on the whole, the tourism industry is low skill and low wage. It's one of those industries which tends to pay lowest in the UK. It's also very seasonal. But with an ecosystem approach in Australia, what they did is start to bolt together fragmented jobs. So that they would mean that invest, so employers have then got a, an incentive to invest in some of those, in some of those people. Because if somebody's only going to stay with you for a summer, why invest in their training? But if you know they're going to be employed with you full time and they're going to be with you during the winter as well, you have the opportunity to train them. So we need to think very carefully about some of those employers, uh, sorry, some of those, some of those issues.